chapter series on linear model selection and regularization. Uh, this lecture is based on chapter 6 of your textbook and, um, and it, it deals with how we can find the best model out of our candidates. So uh, there are three different directions that we go today. Uh, so we, uh, we start talking about each one, one by one. So let me remind you what we had in our course by now. Um, assume you have a linear model like this. This linear model has p features um, x1 through xp. So our feature vector is x1, x2 up to xp. Um, and has an error term. So that's a linear model with an, with an intercept. So there are p plus 1 parameters to be estimated. And nowadays, specifically with uh, the large data sets we have, we usually have a lot of variables and most of them are nonsense and doesn't, have, doesn't change anything in our response variable. This was called the response variable. Response. So one of the questions that is often, often being asked is that how many variables should we choose? Is choosing x1 and x3 give us the best model or x1, x2, x4, so on and so forth. So let's see what, what we're going, how we can choose the best model out of these linear model selection. One thing I want to mention is that most of the methods that you're going to use can be generalized to nonlinear cases. Um, mostly you need to have, uh, you need to use form of like, log likelihood to accommodate it for nonlinear parts. Um, we haven't covered it throughout the course. So I'm uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to omit this part so that we only work with linear models in this chapter. So what are linear models? Linear models have the simplest models we have and they're extremely interpretable. That's the best thing about it. Uh, they're extremely interpretable. Oops. Um, and they have okay predictive performance. They don't have the best predictive performance, but they're, they're good. So, so working with these models are important because uh, that is something that's being used in industry a lot. Um, so uh, that's why we focus on linear models in this case. Um, one of the things that are interesting is when we have um, a lot of variables. Usually, uh, you have, let's say, n observations. And p features. Um, usually, you want to predict a response based on these p features. And sometimes, the amount of features you have, specifically in uh, new types of data sets we have exceeds the number of observations we have. So it's extremely important to know a method to um, to reduce our size to sizable and manageable uh, set and we, we choose let's say M which is less than P predictors that gives us the best models. Most of the models we have here doesn't do anything so um, so let's say beta 2 uh, and beta 4 are equal to 0. That means these things are not uh, important. But if you run a linear regression based on these many variables, you always get a non-zero uh, value for beta 1. So the, the, the art of deciding which one is equal to 0, which means deciding which ones are not important, we're not affecting our uh, model, is models. It, it comes in model selection. There are three method, methods that deals with um, model selection. The one is called subset selection that I co slightly covered it in throughout the course before. The other methods are categorized in shrinkage method. And the last one is dimension reduction ones. Specifically, I th I'm thinking that you've heard about principal component analysis that is in this part. 
lasso, for example, will be categorized as shrinkage method. The subset selection method is like um, forward selection method, backward selection method. These are in the category of subset selection. So let's focus on subset selection methods first and see um, what are the methods that we can use in throughout the course. One of the prereqs you need to have before continuing is uh, knowing what uh, what cross-validation was. Knowing the meaning and notions of cross-validation is important throughout this course. So let me start with subset selection and let's focus on, um, on the general case, best subset selection. So best subset selection is easy. So let me uh, use a blank paper to describe it. Let's say you have p variables, p variables. So let's assume so let's assume um, you have p variables. So let's say for credit data, you have uh, history of your credit history, your balances, your types of credit cards. So you have many different things, right? So you have p variables, p explanatory variables. And you want to estimate a response. So you can do it in many ways. For example, you can say, OK, it's equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 p. Uh, sorry, beta 1 x 1. Or y is equal to beta 0, and you only use one feature, which is x 2. Or you can use two features simultaneously. You can choose, let's say, beta 1 x 1 plus beta 2 x 5. You can have combinations of two features simultaneously. You can have combination of um, p minus one features. Let's say it's p b x one plus beta two x two plus up to beta p minus one x p minus one. I just excluded x p here, so I can have p values at uh, p different combination of linear models that only have uh, p minus 1 value. So if we do the math, the number of ways that we can get a linear model, the number of ways that we can get a linear model with only one variable is 1 out of p. And it is defined this way, p factorial divided by 1 minus, uh, sorry, p minus 1 factorial times 1 factorial, if you do the math, that is p time, p, uh, p version. So we can have p versions of uh, values, uh, models with only one variable. For two variable case, is 2 out of p, which is p factorial divided by p minus 2 factorial times 2 factorial. If you do the math, it's p times p minus 1 divided by 2. Um, lastly, if you have, if you want to choose uh, m uh, variables out of p, then you use it this way: it's p factorial divided by m p minus m factorial times m factorial. In total, in total, we will have um, all the all the models that are only have one only one variable, all the models that have two variables, all the models that have three variables, up to p out of p, which is actually one. Uh, and we I can write it this way: um, i from one to p, i from p. I can also have um, another. Uh, type of uh, model which is only intercept so that is I can get it from 0 to and, 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 and this is only 1 and 0 from P is actually 1 so I can just write it this way and it's not too hard to show that the summation of that is 2 to the power of P so there are 2 to the power of P ways that we can have linear models that gives us um, uh, we, we, there are two to the power of p models that we have to test to find the best one. To give you some perspective of how large it is, let's say we have 10 variables. If you have 10 variables, 
2 to the power of 10 is actually 1024, is roughly 1000, right? It's relatively easy to uh, find 1000, uh, to, to run 1000 models and choose the best one. 2 to the power of 20 is in the order of 1 million. So if you have 20 variables, you have to search for 1 million models to choose the best one. Let's say you have 40 variables. If you have 40 variables, you have to work on 1 trillion models to find the best model, and that is computationally impossible. So, uh, with this method, a method that searches all possible combination of, uh, of models to choose the best one from, is only feasible up to 20 uh, Variable. So let me get back to the first algorithm we have, which is called best subset selection. In best subset selection, you have the null model. Null model is actually a model with only one intercept. So you get M0 and choose the best model that is there. Then then for uh, then you continue and choose the best model that only contains one variable and let's call it m1 then you choose two variables at a time and choose the best model that describes that model and you do it up to k variables so for every combination of variables or let's say for every number of variables you choose the best model out of all possible ones and you call them m0, m1, m2 up to mp, sorry, uh, up to mp, okay, p. So, um, so we, so the idea is we choose the best model which doesn't have any variable, then we choose the best model which only has one variable, best model has two variables, and the way that we choose the best is the one that has largest R square or the least residual sum square. So that is step two. And in step three, we use a method to choose the best of these methods. Um, we, we use a method to choose between all of these best candidates. So we have p candidates, one only has one variable, one only has two variables, the other one has p variable. One thing we can do is use cross-validation to choose the best one, or we can use alternative approaches like CP, which is also called, uh, which is identical to AIC or BIC method or adjusted R square. So I, I will explain these, um, these criteria to choose the best model later in uh, next few um, slides. So let me look over some graphs. Here is the credit data we have, and that is the, re the best residual sum of square error we can get uh, out of each model. For example, uh, let, let me first say we have 10 predictors. We have 10 predictors. Here is the best model we can get with only one predictor. Here is the best model we can get with two predictor. These other points that you see here are the ones that were not the best. So for example, you can have, let's say this is our best model. The one that has x1 and x2 is our best model. So let's say this point is pointing to a point that is a function of x2 and x3. It has two variables, but it chooses x2 and x3 is exponential variable. So as you can see here, we see a very fast jump, a uh, drop in the RSS when we get to the uh, uh, three exponential variables. After that, we are pretty flat. It goes down for sure because that's residual sum of square on training data, uh, but it's pretty flat. So if you want to choose the best model, you perhaps would stick to three. Here's the same thing with R square, or RSS. Uh, and R square are related. Since TSS is the same for all of them, um, RSS and uh, R square and RSS go in different directions. So again, with one variable, this was our R square, two variable, and three variable, we see a huge jump. Then it's, it's flat. 
these other points are other two variable these are, these other points are other two variable models and their corresponding r square this is these variables are other uh, six variable model with their corresponding r square and so on and so forth so Um, so one of the things that I want you to remember is that these models can be extended to other nonlinear models we have, specifically logistic regression. But instead of um, RSS, we have to use a notion of uh, log likelihood. As I said, uh, that is something that we are not going to cover. So for some computational reasons, specifically for the reasons I just explained earlier, when p is very large, we have to find many, many different variables, and it's impossible. It's computationally infeasible. So best subset selection doesn't work that well. That's why we introduce some other methods that can be uh, replaced by that. And those other methods use step-by-step -step model uh, selection. So instead of working over all combinations like this, which was in subset selection. You add one variable at a time, and that's why the computational time it takes so much less than the computational time it takes to um, uh, find all the values, all the combination of values. So the first model that I'm going to ex explain is called forward selection method. A forward selection method, you start with M0. M0 is actually a model that has only an intercept. Then, at the second step, you, you find the best model, you find the best model that, that has one variable. So among all the all the models that have one variable, let's call it beta 1x1, beta 0 plus beta 1x2, or beta 0 plus beta pxp. You choose a model that creates the largest R square. Let's say, let's for the sake of example, assume you choose x2. So our m1 is actually then y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 x2. Then in the next step, um, maybe I can represent it better in my um, in this. So let's say, so in first step we chose um, a model with no coefficient, so that was beta 1, uh, sorry, beta 0. Second step we chose m1 which was beta 0 plus beta 1 X. By the way, um, this beta 0 is different from this one because it's, it's a linear correlation we have. So in, in, in the next step, let's call it step 2, you look at all two variable cases that has x2 in it. So the first one would be this, the second one would be beta 1x2 plus beta 2x3 and you go up to beta 1x2 plus beta 2xp. So from these you choose the best model that you can find. Let's call the best model of M2 the one that has x2 and x5 in it. In the next step, in, in the next step you, you're working for, to find M3 but to do that, your models must have x2 and x5 inside them. So that is beta 0 plus beta 1 x2 plus beta 2 x5. So we start from x1. So we added this. Um, beta 0 plus beta 1 x2 plus beta 2 x5 plus beta 3 x3. And we do it for all values that are there. And we choose the best mod, the best model with three predictors. So one thing I want to mention, and, and we continue that up to MP. 
One thing I want to emphasize is that at each stage we uh, we are looking for only limited number of um, models. In the first stage, we looked at p models to find the best model that is there. And since we have already uh, since in the, in the second step, since we have already fixed one of these variable variables, we are looking for p minus one models. The next stage, we look at p minus two models. And at the very last stage, we only look at one model. So the number of models we are going to look at is 1 plus 2 plus up to p. And that is p times p minus 1 divided by 2, which is p2 minus p divided by 2. To give you some perspective, let's assume we have 40 variables. Remember in subset selection, selection method, when you were looking at all cases, you would look at one trillion instances. In this case, forward selection, you're looking at 40 to the power of 2, which is 100, 1600 minus 40 divided by 2. 1600 minus 40 is um, 800 minus 20. This is 700 and 800 minus 20, 780 models. So in forward selection, we are doing much more better. So in step two, we find the best MKs in each of these models. And at last, at the step three, again, like before, we use a method to find the best model. We either use CP, BIC, or cross-validation. You already know what cross-validation method is. That's my favorite method. But I'm going to teach you how these two are working as well. The next model, the, the next thing we can use is called, um, is called, um, oh, before going there, let me explain what's the difference of forward selection and all model selections. In forward selection, you are not going to necessarily get the same results you get from best subset selection. In step one, in best subset selection, in this data, you get rating as the best variable. In second step, you get rating and income. So income was added. In third step, you get rating and income and student. <coughs> I'm sorry. In fourth step, you get the best four combination of variables you get would be credit cards, income, student limit. So it doesn't have rating in it if you do best selection. But if you work with forward selection, all the variables that have been um, found in previous steps shall be in your forces step. That's why the forces step you have in forward selection will be completely different from best subset. So the, the results you get from best subset selection is not necessarily the same as forward sele uh, so stepwise selection method. And I want to emphasize on that because usually uh, when people get to this point you say, okay, why it's not the case? It's because in forward stepwise, we fixed number of variables that we had earlier. In best se subset selection, we find the best combination of variables, which have four variables, for example, in the data, and it may change from three. So the, what, the things we see in four variables might be completely different from the three variable case. So the next alternative would be backward stepwise selection. It's a very efficient way uh, that can can be used instead of uh, best subset selection, and it's it's almost the same as forward selection in terms of computation. But it goes in a reverse direction. So instead of um, adding variables one by one, you remove variables by one by one, and uh, that's how it works. Uh, I'm not going to too much detail of it, I, so I just read through it slightly fast. So in the first step, you consider a model with all possible variables. That is your 
the first thing you estimate. In next step, you drop one variable at a time and choose, uh, and you drop the variable which, which most uh, reduces R square. Um, and, um, and, and, and if you, sorry, sorry, I, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. So you, you, you drop one variable such that uh, it least affect your R square. So you, in, in other words, you're dropping the variable which least affect your outcome. Because if it was effective on your outcome, then it R square would drop hugely. So you start with MP, then choose the best model with P minus one variables. Then next time, if you if you drop one variable, let's say, um, let's say here at second stage I drop x2, then you will never use it again. Um, in next step, you don't have x2, then you will get rid of the another least important variable. Let's call that variable um, x5. Then in next step, you get rid of x5 and x2 simultaneously, and then get rid of the next least important variable up to M0, which only has intercept. And then you have M0 model, MP model, MP minus one up to M0 model, and they use again cross validation or some new um, criteria to choose the best model. Uh, as I said, computationally, these two methods are identical. The only difference it has is that you cannot use backward selection if n is less than p. That means if your number of observations is less than number of predictors, you cannot use backward selection, but you can always use forward stepwise. That's the only thing you want to remember. Um, so, uh, so let me get back to the here. Okay, I said you can use cross validation method to choose the best M, M model possible, or some other alternatives called CP, BIC, or adjusted R square. Cross validation, I have covered it um, in the throughout the course very extensively. Um, but but the other methods that are here we, we I haven't uh, I haven't touched it before so let me get there so CP so we we have we generally we have two approaches generally we have two approaches D one of them is when you use direct estimate of your test error to choose which model does the best, and that's cross-validation approach. That's that's the one you already know. The other one is not using test error, but make an adjustment for your observation. So you're not going to uh, split your data into test and training data. You only use your training data, but you're trying to uh, take into account the bias, which is caused by um, bias. Here is a short, that is a reminder um, if you have two models, let's say beta 0 plus beta 1x, and you have uh, y equal to beta 0 plus beta 1x1 plus beta 2x2, the sum residual of a square, residual sum of a square of this model is always better than this one. Why? Because you can easily set beta 2 to 0, and that that will be identical to what you had before. So the second model always have lower RSS. But if you have a method that would penalize RSS for additional uh, variables you add to your model, then you can have a balance. So these sort of adjustments are done through uh, the three methods that I'm going to describe to you. CP, BIC, and adjusted R square. Um, these models assume, okay, uh, RSS is going to decrease, but why don't we penalize our models for extra variables we have here? So, 
and they are very, extremely easy methods to use. So let me show you how these techniques work. So these techniques adjust the training error for the model size um, by penalizing you for choosing more variables. At the, at the same time RSS decreases, you have a penalizing factor that, that, um, that adjusts for that. And there are mainly three things that we have to cover, CP, BIC, and R square, adjusted R square. So, so let me tell you what, how these, um, these models work. In these models, we first assume, our assumption is, we only work with training data. With training data. And we penalize models with more variables. So we have a term here. Whenever you add more variables, we penalize it. So, um, so in CP and BIC method, that which I will explain in a second, your goal is to choose the least amount of error, you, uh, the, the least amount of value you get here. So here you choose six variables, but if I were you, I would choose three variables because after three, everything gets flat here. So if I, I were presented with this model, I would choose M3. M, remember M3 was a model which had three variables in it. The same results can be uh, can be got from BIC. So you choose the minimum is at four, but it's very close to three, so I would choose M3 again. And adjusted this R square method, you, you want to choose the highest adjusted R square method. Again, three variables, which is here, gives us the least amount of error. After that, everything becomes flat, though, although this is the real minimum here. But as I mentioned throughout the course many, many times, the simpler, the better. So you want to choose a model with least vari possible variables. If you do not see huge improvement for adding more variables, just choose the one that is stick there. For example, here from two variables for the model with two predictors to three, we see a huge jump. But from three to four, we didn't see that much jump. So let's see how this works. So let's work with Malo CP. That's uh, that is a way to validate things. Malo's CP. Malo's CP is a measure that considers residual sum square. The RSS stands for residual sum square, and if I want to remind you, that is why are your predictions minus sorry your observations minus predictions squared plus 2d, d here is number of predictors, times the standard uh, variance of your error. So sigma hat 2 is variance of error. So let's see what this does. So, so as I said, when you add more variables, RSS tends to go down. So when, when you, so let's say add more variables, add more variables. If you do that, RSS goes down, but D also goes, sorry, RSS goes down. Okay, RSS goes down, but D goes up because you use more variables. So this term goes down, this term goes up. So you adjust for number of predictors you choose. So. So once you have your models, use the RSS of each model and then put it in perspective. You get a graph like this. I show you in our sessions how to get that. You choose the, the one that minimizes it. In a very similar notion, you can have AIC and, and for linear models, AIC and Malo CP are the same thing. Get minus two log of, uh, log of likelihood function 
plus 2 times d. Um, it's worth noting that uh, log of L in linear model is RSS divided by, I think it was divided by 2, um, it was divided by 2 uh, sigma hat 2. So I, you can you can figure out the math. These two I, A, I, C, and C P will always give you the same answer. So A, I, C is another measure. Works exactly the, in the same fashion that uh, C P works. So so the goal here is to penalize your model based on um, the amount of improvement you get RSS. The more variables you choose the lower your RSS, but you penalize it this way, so that's why you get these curvy shapes. Another model we had which is closely related to um, CP Mallow's, Mallow CP, is called uh, BIC, and that has RSS, and it penalizes it through adding D this way. So if RSS goes down by adding more variables, this term goes up. Again, BIC will look like uh, this because you, the more variables you choose, uh, the the better, uh, the more likely it is that it changes. So that is just another measure uh, to choose the best model. Again, in none of these models, BAC and CP you choose test data, you only use training data. And D is number of variables, sigma hat is the standard deviation, uh, variant. sigma hat is the standard deviation of your error terms, that's why sigma hat 2 is the variance of your model. Um, so when n is more than 7, logarithm of n will become more than 2. And remember, in this textbook, logarithm is natural logarithm, so it's logarithm in E, and it's also ln. So when n is more than 7, meaning that you have more than 7 observation, logarithm of n is more than 2. Um, if you compare this with CP, CP was 1 over n RSS plus 2, d sigma hat 2. So since log of n is more than 2 for n more than 7, usually we have more than 7 observations, that means it puts more penalty um, on more variables than CP. Okay, so for for n more than 7, BIC puts more variable, more penalty on models with more variables, and that's why you usually choose less variables based on BIC than CP. So here, BIC, the, the, the very optimal one, gave us four variables, and CP gave us six variables. That's, that's why, that's because BIC puts more penalty on choosing more variables than in comparison to CP. Uh, the very last, um, uh, the very last type of uh, model we can have, which only uses training data, help us to avoid getting into the trouble of dealing with cross-validation is using adjusted daughter square. Adjusted daughter square is very close to R square. Let me remind you what R square was. R square was 1 minus RSS divided by TSS. Adjusted daughter square is has n minus d minus 1 in denominator of RSS. So if d goes up, without changing RSS. If D goes up, RSS divided by D goes down, but 1 minus, um, and that's why 1 minus RSS divided by that will go down. So more Ds will result in lower adjusted R square if it doesn't significantly increase RSS. One of the good things about adjusted R square is that um, it's always easier for non, uh, non statistician to understand adjusted R square because it's very close to the notion of R square itself. 
So it's easy to work with. It uses the same notions, RSS and TSS. It doesn't use standard error of model. It doesn't use a standard deviation of your error, which is all, uh, sometimes very hard to compute. So my suggestion for you would be that um, if you're using software, choose CP and AIC or BIC. If you're if you do not have that much of computational power, and if you're sticking with um, Excel files, please stick to adjusted data square because it's very easy to compute. You usually have RSS and TSS as um, as simple outputs of any software you use. Uh, even in Excel, you have RSS and TSS, and, the, and usually this uh, this um, value is given to you. So my suggestion would be to stick to that if you do not have that much computational power or that much sophistication in using softwares. Um, so let's get back to this slide. So in, if you're using adjusted data square for your models, then choose the highest adjusted data square you get. Again, look over your model if you do not see that much uh, improvement in it. Choose the model with lower amount of observ uh, variables. So, so let's work on the next model we have instead of uh, cross-validation, instead of CP and BIC and adjusted data square, we can use cross-validation. And cross-validation is definitely my most uh, favorite method because you do not need to estimate any error of variance. Remember uh, variance error because in BIC and AIC and CP we all always need an estimate of variance of error but in cross-validation you do not need to. Let me remind you what cross-validation was. I think that's a good recap. In cross-validation you're not going to waste any any data. Let's say uh, you divide your data into four subsets. Let's call these subsets. Each time you're going to assign some part of your data as test set. This is test. This is also test, and this is also test, and this part is also test. So your training set, you, you, you use the rest of your model as training set, train a model, and then apply it on your test set, and get RSS of test. You do the same thing in model, you train it with this training set, and test it on your that, so you get another, uh, you get another RSS of test. And you do it four times, that is cross validation of the a fourfold cross validation, and then take an average of these uh, test RSS. Then you validate your model based on that. You want to achieve the lowest um, cross validation error. Choose a model that creates the lowest cross validation error. Usually, you use five to ten folds of cross validation. That, that's also a recap. And um, and uh, for credit model, uh, you you just uh, use the same thing. So let me let me get back to our slides. For a credit model, I'm using cross validation, um, and let's let's compare it with. Um, with BIC. In BIC, we found that four was the optimal one, but as I told you, choose uh, three. In cross validation, you find six, but again, you see the same trend. If, you, if I were to choose how many variables to choose, I would choose three here. You can also have validation sets. Validate, uh, validation sets is when you have a lot of data and you can have a privilege of setting aside some part as one set of tests and having the rest as training data. So you, you use your training data to train your algorithm and then 
uh, applied on test data. That is called validation. It's not cross-validation because you're not going to change this test data. That test data will be there all the time. You use some portion of your data training and then use it, test data to test it. So the point I want to make is that if you use cross-validation in this part, again, your favorite um, model will be the one that has three. There is a general rule which is called the one standard error rule and that is being used nowadays by statisticians a lot. And that is usually when you estimate these errors you get standard error of your errors as well and you just draw that as box plots around your uh, points. If the value you get before is within um, this, uh, this interval, you choose the previous one. So basically what you do is that you have a bunch of points, let's say this point, this point, and this point. Then you draw an interval, one standard deviation above and below that. If you have a point before which is within one standard deviation of your minimum, then you, you vote for that one because it gives you the simpler model. And that's the, I, I, I bet if you do if stick to, if you stick to this one standard error method, you would choose three variables. So the three variable method um, sorry, the, the one standard error method assumes that um, if you are within one standard deviation of your error then you choose the model size that is the smallest because our rule is the small the simpler the better okay just to summarize what we have learned so far we we learned two different methods to validate our let me summarize it in uh, another slide. Uh, let me summarize it here. So we want to choose best linear function. Best linear function. There were three methods that we learned in the class. Subset selection. Forward. Forward stepwise forward selection and backward selection. We said this is infeasible to deal with specifically for large P's because uh, the magnitude of computation is in the order of 2 to the power of P. It's impossible to deal with it when you have 40 observations here. The magnitude is around P2 over 2. So roughly P2 over 2, so depending on how many variables we have. And then in forward and backward selection, you choose the best model with no coefficient, best model with one coefficient, and lastly, best model with all P coefficients. So you want to find the best one of them. There are two different methods you can do. One is to focus on training set and adjust the adjust for um, more variables. So if you want to do that, you will get three models. CP, which is also AIC, most of the applications, BIC, and lastly, adjust the daughter square. Or you want to use test set. And if you want to use test set, you can use validation which is you set aside part of your data and just use that as a test or you use cross-validation. In cross-validation you're not wasting any data point. And based on that you use it. And lastly I introduced another um, another term and that is one standard error method. One standard error case. In one standard error case when you have these observations, uh, let's say this is your 
uh, CP uh, or cross validation, whatever you want to call it, um, outcomes. Um, you go one standard deviation above and below your points. And let's say this is my minimized version. If you can find a simpler method, which is within this one standard deviation, and here this point is, use this much flexibility. Because we have one rule, and that's the third time I'm writing it. The simpler, the better. OK, so I stop the lecture here, and I come back with another method. In the beginning of the course, I said there are a couple of ways to deal with this um, best model selection. Uh, one of them was um, subset selection method. Another one is shrinkage method. So in what will follow, I will teach you how to deal with some of these shrinkage methods, namely ridge regression and lasso. Okay, thank you for now.